people from all over the world coming to celebrate Bitcoin. So Ulf Haydn, your moderator for this panel on how to orange pill the masses. Ulf, take the stage, good sir. Get a round of applause for Ulf, please. So you come on, come on. So <laughs> everybody. So I'm very excited to have you all here. Uh, thank you very much. Sit down. Um, today's topic is uh, orange pilling the masses, and we have a very diverse panel here uh, with a surprise. Not Paco is not the surprise. We have a later. We will have a later surprise then. So, um, one word for me, I'm Ulf Heiden, I work for a German media outlet and I've been also privately over the last years been uh, uh, amb ambassador for Bitcoin, I'm organizing Bitcoin boot camps for some people and yes, um, our topic today is orange pilling the masses and I want to get a little bit into, into give a little bit of context here on this topic, so I don't know probably most of you are familiar with this, that or where, the, where the term orange pilling comes from, but probably not everybody, or not everybody is really recalling it. So it refers to uh, Morpheus asking Neo in the film Matrix uh, whether he should take the red pill or the blue pill. And uh, this is, in a way, the way to convince somebody. And so we have a lot of Morpheus here on the stage uh, today, and uh, yes, this is what, I, what we are talking to. And I would like to ask you to first make a short introduction and then um, uh, a little bit elaborate a little bit on uh, what orange pilling means. I mean, orange pilling can mean that you convince somebody for her the first Bitcoin con transaction, or you can, it can mean that you that you get, give, get him to read the, the uh, Seyfedean's Bitcoin standard or everything else. So what's your idea of orange pilling? And we start with Alan first. Wow, tough question. Actually, among my non-fiat friends, I never use the word orange pill. Uh, <laughs> to me, orange pill is when a person has made the mental decision or desire to own or be a part of the Bitcoin community. So they now have a desire to be there. They're on the same page as us. They may or may not be off zero yet, but I'm sure they will be soon. And in case you don't know, I'm Alan Jackson from Northern yeah. California. I have the opportunity in my work to travel extensively. And so I have many opportunities to interact with people across the country, foreign countries. And not a day goes by or I do not offer people the opportunity to join the Bitcoin world. Uh, I like to share the usefulness of Bitcoin. I like to share how I use it, integrate it into my life. One man told me, wow, you're the first person I met that tries to transact their life in Bitcoin. And I'm not quite there 100% yet, but uh, I just love to share the love of Bitcoin and to bring as many people off zero as possible. And uh, so it's just a passion I have to talk to people. And I'm sure my associates sometimes get tired of hearing it. But by the end of a few days, guess what? They are taking Bitcoin and they understand the value proposition. Whoa. Next, Rico Aro. Hello, everyone. My name is Ricky. I'm an Italian podcaster. Uh, in, I am the co-host of the main uh, Bitcoin podcast in Italian language. And I'm also a vlogger. I have a project called Bitcoin Explorers on YouTube. We chronicle Bitcoin adoption in emerging markets. And how to orange pill the world? First of all, I don't like the word orange pilling, okay? Uh, because why is that? Um, I hope teaching Bitcoin was something as easy as swallow a pill, right? You swallow it and boom, you're a Bitcoiner. It's, it's misleading. It's such a complex process. It takes a lot of time to understand this break ground tech, new technology. Uh, so uh, I have the opportunity to teach, to teach Bitcoin uh, to a lot of people. Uh, uh, the way I see it, I'm an activist, so I come from that background. The way I see Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the most powerful tool to protect human rights and financial freedom all around the world before 
uh, the have fun, staying poor thing, that the price doesn't even matter. The price is a consequence of the technology and of the social revolution. So I think that's the key. Once people realize Bitcoin is going to be fundamental for their surviving in what's going to happen next, that's the moment they get it. Before, they're trying. Okay. The next Paco, tell us your story. Uh, hola, buenas tardes a todos. <laughs> Yo me llamo Ooh. Paco y soy de la India. Namaste. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Paco. I'm from India. I read a book last year called The Bitcoin Standard, which is the Bible. And uh, I started traveling. I came up with an idea to travel 40 countries in 400 days by using Bitcoin. Uh, 400 days got finished, traveled 22 countries, and was able to use Bitcoin in many places. But as they say, we are very early. We are very, very, very early uh, because there's a long way to go up ahead. And this is all a bubble. We all are in a bubble right here too. <laughs> but this is what will take us forward. So El Salvador is very, very, is muy importante para nosotros. We need El Salvador to succeed because the world is watching. So yeah, that's a little bit of me, please. All right, then Ben, uh, first congratulations to being the hardest Bitcoiner in the world, or at least Thank here you. in this room, <laughs> just won the contest. So Ben, tell us a little bit about your story and how you define orange billing. Sure, so my name's Ben. Um, I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Swan Bitcoin. Um, Aside from that, I've, uh, I've been a Bitcoiner for a very long time. I discovered Bitcoin in 2010, mined four blocks, deleted it because I thought, uh, you know, it was useless and SETI at home would be more interesting, you know, let's just look for aliens instead. About a year later, I kind of rediscovered it and thought, hold on, why is this thing not dead yet? Why hasn't the government shut it down? And then I actually, you know, bothered to read the white paper and uh, learn how it works and said, Oh, wow, okay, um, you know, they can't shut it down. This is, this is something interesting. This is something worth looking into. So since then, you know, I've been kind of going further and further down the rabbit hole. And around 2017, I made kind of a realization. I said to myself, the opportunity cost of spending Bitcoin is the same as the opportunity cost of holding fiat that you could have exchanged for Bitcoin but didn't. So why do I continue to hold fiat? So I stopped doing that. My family stopped doing that. I've got a wife, got two kids. We do not have bank accounts with more than zero in them. You know, uh, we will... <laughs> we, will tra we will transact with fiat as a medium of exchange where necessary because you, know, you can't spend Bitcoin everywhere yet, but we preferentially spend Bitcoin. So, um, you know, obviously a part of my life is going around and convincing people to take Bitcoin from me because that's our preferred payment method. That's, you know, what we do. Um, and, yeah, that's, I also, like pretty much everyone else here mentioned, uh, the term orange pilling, I, I'm not such a fan of it, but, um, you know, if we have to talk about that, then I'd say, yeah, it, it really means multitude of things, everything from getting somebody to transact in their very first um, transaction. So, you know, if I convince a taxi driver to take Bitcoin from me instead of fiat, which I do a lot, by the way, taxi drivers for some reason, easy. Um, convince a taxi driver to take Bitcoin from me, then, uh, yeah, you know, that's his first step along his journey, and you could call that the orange pilling journey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree also that uh, this is a process. I think that this is consensus here on the, on the panel, that it's a long process, and it begins with bringing somebody for the first transaction. So, Alan, tell us a little bit about that. You told me that you usually um, tip the people when you drive or in your fly. Uh, what, what, what's your experience then with these uh, people? How many people uh, accept Bitcoin and say, don't say, no, tip me in fiat? Yeah, so I travel quite extensively. So every night I'm in a different hotel. So I'm in an Uber to the hotel or hotel shell to the hotel. I'll say, Mr. Driver, I have a question. It may be the most important decision you'll make today. And I want to give you a tip for taking us two pilots to the airport, I mean to the hotel. Either way, what would you prefer, a Bitcoin tip or a tip in cash? It doesn't matter to me. I like Bitcoin, but the difference is this. 
Bitcoin will grow in value over time. And the cash I give you today is worth less tomorrow than I give you today. So uh, what should you like? And if I have time now, I, if I'm in the Uber for 20 minutes, uh, my success rate goes up because I have more opportunities to share with them how Bitcoin is changing the lives of people around the world, how it's changing my life. People ask me, so why are you giving away money? Because they see me giving away money and I say, you know, I love the transaction of Bitcoin. My wife might buy a cup of coffee for four or five dollars and enjoy it. I'll give two people a tip in Bitcoin. I guarantee I'm going to enjoy this experience more than her with her nice cup of coffee. And so, but if I, I might see people in a, some, I, I tip people in the store. I'm at uh, the technology store, uh, Best Buy. Hey, Mr. Best Buy guy, do you know much about Bitcoin? No? Well, let me tell you about this incredible technology and I'll give a guy in the store, he's not selling necessarily, but I'll give anybody who will listen to, listen to me a tip in Bitcoin to show them how it works. And I give them my business card because here's my business card. If you have any questions, I want to be your Bitcoin resource. Don't hesitate. And if you don't want Bitcoin, that's fine. The day may come when you may want some Bitcoin. So here's my card. Text me a question. I will help you anytime I can. All right. Okay. Is it same question to, to Paco. A um, little bit. What is your, usually your motivation when it comes to Orange Pool somebody? Let's tell, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, uh, how many people were getting sweets? I was giving some sweets away. Hands up. <laughs> okay. So, this is how you orange pill. Uh, you give, see, Bitcoin is a feeling. Bitcoin is a feeling, you feel it when you receive it. Now, all these people raised up, these plebs raised up their hands because they felt the sweetness. <laughs> That's Bitcoin. So, generally, I go up to, I, I think so there's uh, Satoshi that's guiding me in orange peeling. I generally walk up the bus story that I was telling you. If I'm sitting on a bus with someone, I would be like, hey, do you know Bitcoin? Because I wear Bitcoin here. I don't, Paco. I don't. Tell me about it. Do you want some Bitcoin? Yes, I do. There you go. <laughs> See, people want to get it. People, because uh, you, as they say, you can buy a fraction of Bitcoin. So this is how you... you I think so you have to just go sometimes cold turkey on people and just say, like, I can, I want to just stand up and do this because I've been waiting for this. This cap is on Bitcoin, bought on Bitcoin, shorts bought on Bitcoin, <laughs> flip-flops on Bitcoin. Yeah. And the funny part is, this is from India on Bitcoin, from Mozambique on Bitcoin, from Cameroon on Bitcoin, from Singapore on Bitcoin. That means there are these countries that accept Bitcoin. There are people that accept Bitcoin. Only thing is that we have to reach out to them. And there are Bitcoiners everywhere, and it's easy. I think so. The more you share, the more you care. The more you care, the more you share. All right, yeah. great, thanks. So um, I, then we should a little bit go in, in the, into the practical side of orange pilling. So the first step is then to get somebody a wallet. And then, so my question would be to the, all of you: Which wallets do you recommend to onboard easily onboard? new people and to show them the, the real great, great experience of receiving a lightning transaction, for example. So, uh, Ben, will you start? Yep, sure. So, to me, it actually depends a lot on who they are and how I've been talking to them already. So, you know, there's a lot of great wallets out there and I'm, you know, I'm always hesitant to say, hey, this is the best wallet for, new for newbies because, you know, there are just so many differences between them. Um, and a lot of it is going to depend on our discussion. So if I've been talking to the person about um, security, for example, then obviously I'm not going to recommend something custodial. You know, I'm not going to recommend Wallet of Satoshi. But if I'm talking to um, you know, um, some younger person who really, you know, they're not going to store a huge amount of value, they're not going to be able to manage seed backups, we haven't talked about security, we haven't talked about self-sovereignty, then yeah, I'm going to recommend Wallet of Satoshi. So different wallets for different kinds of people and different kinds of needs. And of course, you know, I can then continue the conversation. So you know, if I set somebody up with Wallet of Satoshi, of course I'm going to say, hey, this actually isn't really your Bitcoin. This is uh, your Bitcoin which you've got access to, but you know, we're going to have to have another conversation um, in order to you know, figure out you know, what the next steps are for this person. I think uh, it's always an ongoing conversation. It's not something you just uh, you know, fire and forget. Right. Alan? Uh, I think my go-to wallet is the Moon Wallet. When they first got a Bitcoin, I asked Michael Atwood from OCAP, 
Mr. Al would tell me, what is the easiest wallet to give to somebody that they can receive some Bitcoin? So the moon wallet is my go-to wallet. So as I am sharing about the beauty of Bitcoin and this free moon wallet, people ask me, is this your moon wallet? Like, am I benefiting? I said, no, no, this is a great wallet developed by some Argentinians who know the value of the loss of money through hyperinflation they've experienced. And uh, so I love the moon wallet. But I tell them, no, I'm going to give you some Bitcoin. But you know what? I don't want to give you Bitcoin from my moon wallet. I could, but Bitcoin is too valuable for me. So I'm going to use a different app called Strike to give you some Bitcoin. So I like to have them uh, receive the Bitcoin, the, the moon wallet. I tell them quickly, now make sure tonight you briefly go into security and you download the little phrase, give a copy to your mother, because if you lose it, hopefully she's more responsible or somebody you trust. But uh, so I, it depends on the time frame I have, but my, the moon wallet is my go-to wallet. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you, Ben. Depends on uh, who I'm talking to. Uh, if, uh, if it's a brand new guy, maybe a grandpa, I go with Wallet of Satoshi because lightning transactions, they are always impressive mm -hmm. uh, uh, to someone that is completely new to Bitcoin. Yep. And Wallet of Satoshi, even if it's true, not your keys, not your coins, so technically those are not your coins. I think Wallet of Satoshi is by far the easiest uh, UI. It's, ba I mean, two buttons, literally. And it's instant. It, work, it works like a charm. Uh, if I'm talking to someone that, that, it's already, that knows already a little bit about the technology, I like, to, I, I like to tip on Blue Wallet. Because in Blue Wallet, you have two different wallets, right? The on-chain wallet that it's fully non-custodial, it gives you your, your seed phrase and everything, and then you have the lightning wallet. And that, I believe, helps people understand the difference between layer one on-chain and yeah. layer two, the lightning network. In order, to, uh, uh, in order to send money on the lightning network, you have to move them from your own chain wallet to the lightning wallet. And that's very helpful, I believe, to make them understand what's the difference between the lightning protocol and the Bitcoin protocol. Yeah, good. Paco, any help? Uh, any wallet That's the same wallets. <laughs> I, I started with blue wallet. It was fun. Then I moved to wallet of Satoshi and moon wallet. So if the person is educated and I see him or her able to save their keys, then it's moon wallet. But if it's a noob, it's wallet of Satoshi because that's the reason we got banks, right? Because we want somebody to take care of us. Mm -hmm. That's why we give the coins. Yeah. And for wallet of Satoshi, I heard even if they go away, we still have our coins. We still have them. So wallet of Satoshi, moon, uh, that's a Blue is blue is good. Blue is good. All right, great. Thank you for sharing this valuable insights. Great. Um, now let's come to the in a little bit of way the blue pills. There are people who are distracted, and what really distracts people? Either way, you argument to them, that you you, you say, say everything to them. What distracts people from Bitcoin, or what what are typical distractors? Ben, start. Yeah. Ben. So what I notice most is either people, there are basically two possibilities. Either people just don't seem to care. So you know, I'm talking to them about the wrong kinds of things. You know, one thing I always try to do is figure out what is interesting to somebody, um, what are the problems they are having with money. You know, that's going to be different for different kinds of people. And based on the problem, that's how I talk about Bitcoin to them. You know, if it's self-sovereignty, then I'll talk about self-sovereignty. If it's about inflation, you know, that's what I'll talk about. There's a lot of different ways that you can talk to people about Bitcoin. But some people, you know, perhaps I'm talking to them about the wrong thing, and they just don't seem to care. So that's kind of one aspect. But probably a much bigger one is that most people now have heard of Bitcoin. You know, it's very rare to actually encounter somebody who hasn't heard of it at all. And most of what people hear comes from mainstream media FUD. 
and you know, be, immediately people hear the word Bitcoin and they're like, oh no, you know, it's boiling the oceans, it's uh, destroying our environment, it's bad for the world, um, it's a giant Ponzi scheme, uh, you know, all of these ridiculous things that you know, we know is not true, but fighting FUD takes a lot more energy than mm -hmm. spreading FUD. So you know, uh, that, those are the kinds of main, distract, main distractors that um, yeah, cause problems for trying to get people to, un to at least have that conversation. Yeah. Ricardo, anything to add as a podcaster or uh, um, in the media? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I don't think, though, it's a matter of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, it's so early. Uh, as Bitcoiners, we would love this technology to succeed quickly, fast. Truth is, history proves us wrong, right? Uh, let's think, for example, about credit cards. Credit cards were invented in 1949 by a guy named Frank McNamara. Diners, that's the first credit card in history, 1949. It took credit cards 50 years, 60 years to starting to get relevant, not to reach mass adoption. So. The problem is that it's very early, and this is an incredibly disruptive technology, philosophically, right? So most of the pre-coiner, I like to call them pre-coiner, not no-coiners, because a no-coiner is a denier. A pre-coiner is someone that does not know yet. So pre-coiners, they don't think is they don't think they need it. They, th they don't think it, it solves problems, but they will eventually realize it. So we have to be patient and we have to give this thing time mm. and keep up with the good work, of course. <laughs> POW. <laughs> uh, but, but coming back on media, on mass media, uh, let me take an adversarial point and say what would happen if mass media would advocate Bitcoin like everybody here would be. Would, would Bitcoin be ready for the masses? High fees on chain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. So I, I'd add there, high fees on chain, sure, but that would also bring in so many more new developers, so many more new people yeah. building stuff in this mm -hmm. space. I think even if it's not ready immediately, it would become ready much more quickly. And let me say, the Lightning Network can scale a lot. So I'm not sure Bitcoin is... Uh, first of, w one thing first. Bitcoin is the Lightning Network and the Lightning Network is Bitcoin, right? Because it's so early, we tend to make a difference between, but it's just another layer of the same thing, like internet has multiple layer, and we don't say, I just use the HTTP or... Uh, so they are the same thing. The Lightning Network can scale a lot, so I'm not sure it's ready for mass adoption yet, but it can take a lot. Okay, okay. So then, then let's ta talk about the level of adoption. This morning we heard some, some numbers from Chain Analysis. I think there's also a company called Blockware who's got some statistics on it. I want your experience as world travelers uh, how many people, what, what's your estimates in the countries you've been, uh, how many people use Bitcoin? And we start with Paco first. Okay, uh, guys, uh, uh, I traveled around Africa. I, did, I traveled to 15 African countries using Bitcoin. And, that, and Africa is, a, it's like 54 countries, 1.5 billion people. No, I think so in Kenya I found eight places that accept Bitcoin. The thing is, there's a strong crypto community. There's a strong crypto community. Like, I can say Nigeria can replace IMF. Nigeria has so much liquidity. So Nigerians are number one in the world for doing P2P transactions. So we can remove IMF and put Nigeria in there, mm -hmm. and we are good. Similarly, Kenya, Nairobi, I would say, is Singapore of Africa. Because Nairobi has the youth that's going at it. There's a strong youth going around. But Bitcoin adoption, I will still say we are 25 years away, 30 years away. We have a lot of work to do. We just have to keep our heads down and keep orange pilling. I say this, I, I saw a bit of Asia. Sri Lanka was one country where I was, and it collapsed. 
And we need more countries to collapse. That's when it happens. Mm -hmm. When the countries collapse, in Sri Lanka, what happened? They didn't have dollars. With no dollars, there is no petrol. With no petrol, there's no electricity. With no electricity, there's no job. With no job, there's hyperinflation. And then you collapse. And when, if, if five to seven countries fall down, that's when hyper-Bitcoinization starts. Because first we need pain to appreciate the joy. And there is pain coming. The countries, moneda, uh, como se dice, moneda. The currency. The currencies are falling down, you know? Like, one dollar was, every country that got uh, independence was one is to one. In Congo, it is one is to 2,000. In Zimbabwe, I went to billions, trillions. In Nigeria, one is to 800. In Kenya, one is to 120. So we need those currencies to fall down for hyper-Bitcoinization to happen. Because pain is the mother of everything, right? All right. Yeah. Any other experiences? Yeah. Oh, um, how many people accept Bitcoin or use Bitcoin in the world? Oh, very little. Um, we are a small community and it's okay. As I said, it's very early. So I would, I would be surprised otherwise. Um, even in this country, for example, uh, on this very same stage, uh, today someone said that 20% Salvadorian are using Bitcoin. That's a lie. Total lie. I mean, just walk the streets, uh, talk to the companies. There's Galoi here, there's Ibex. They are running the lightning infrastructure in this country. No way 20% or Salvadorian. That's more than a million people is transacting in Bitcoin. Not yet. The adoption in the streets is very small. I travel this, I've been traveling this country extensively only in Bitcoin. It's hard to pay in Bitcoin. And, you, and when you convince someone, they rather take your cash. But it's okay. It's just one year and a half. We don't have to lie. We don't have to do propaganda. We have to work and yeah. wait. Bitcoin is inevitable. We don't have to cheer for Bitcoin. Nobody cares about Bitcoin fanboys. Bitcoin is going to happen anyway. Just let's give him time and not jump out with numbers for, to feed the press. That's shitcoin. That's, shit co that, that's what shitcoins do. Yeah, that's right. Any, anything else here? Uh, uh, 25 years, Paco? Oh my goodness, 25 years for worldwide adoption. So people ask me, Alan, why do you spend so much energy sharing Bitcoin? Because I'm not a young person. I'm gray haired, I just turned 60. I wanna see Bitcoin world adoption in my lifetime. So I need to give people Bitcoin. I need to encourage them to give Bitcoin. And uh, so I'm a giver and also an educator because I believe in the gradually then suddenly uh, thought process. So I'm hoping for 10 years. So I'm going to agree with Ricky definitely that you know, it's, um, we need to um, we need to just wait for growth, and yeah, it's a lot smaller than uh, you know a lot of people are kind of fanboying and saying. But there is a large number of people out there who are silent Bitcoiners. Yeah. So one thing you know, I notice, like I, when I go around and I ask people, "Will you take Bitcoin?" A lot of the time, the answer I've had is, "My company doesn't, but I'll take Bitcoin for, from you and put fiat in the till." So you know. There are people that take Bitcoin, even if the businesses don't. And uh, I think that's you know, a relatively large, silent majority. Yeah. Well, what are um, motivations of people to silently adopt uh, Bitcoin? Um, tell me a little bit. You, you are very much into sovereignty, sovereign money. Tell us a little bit about, about the story there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm very much into the idea of Bitcoin as sovereign money, controlling your own money and not having other people, not having middlemen, not having other people be able to do things with your money. I mean, um, I've got plenty, uh, there's plenty of kind of stories out there, but one canonical one I always kind of tell is uh, a few years ago, I was trying to buy a really expensive computer, like you know, over a $10,000 kind of computer, um, just because I could and I wanted to and I wanted that computer, so why not? And I hit the buy button, and then my bank cancelled the transaction. And then I called the bank and said, hey, I'm trying to buy a computer. And they're like, no, you're not. Yeah, I am. 
no, no, that, that's fraud. I'm like, no, I'm actually trying to buy a computer. This is my money, right? Yeah, but normal people don't buy computers that are worth that much. We're not letting you buy that. I actually had to argue with my bank for over a week to spend my own money to buy a personal computer. You know, that was, that was one of the things that convinced me. It's obviously, you know, Western privilege, that kind of thing. You know, not everyone can buy that kind of uh, device. But, you know, if, if people can do that to your money, they can do that to your money for much worse reasons. You know, we don't like you. We're not letting you spend your money. You've got the wrong political views. We're not letting you spend your money. You're working in the wrong kind of industry. We're not letting you spend your money. Bitcoin fixes this. Yeah, awesome. Um, ben, yesterday we had your talk or the talk of your daughter. And I originally wanted to ask you the question how Samantha is orange pilling uh, her pupil, other pupils. And this is the surprise here now. I would like to come to Samantha to come to the stage and tell us a little ooh, bit ooh, about this. Ooh, right. ooh, ooh. Awesome. Hello, Samantha. That was a, such an amazing speech. You, you were so convincing. That's Thank an you. awesome speech. Thank so you. very great. So tell us a little bit about your experiences to uh, Orange Pool people. Um, so the most, one of the most recent people I've orange pilled is probably one of my classmates. I've orange pilled like three or four of my classmates now, and I've <laughs> and I've also um, in LA at Pacific Bitcoin, I got the bartender that didn't accept Bitcoin. He only accepted Bitcoin tips. I got him to talk to me about Bitcoin and orange pilled him too. Um, so mainly the first time I orange pilled someone, it was probably my friend Maya um, from school. And we, it basically started off about her talking about Bitcoin and that I'm going to be on stage for a Bitcoin conference. And she didn't really understand it. So I helped her. I explained it a bit to her and I helped her understand it. And then she asked me more questions about, like, what if Bitcoin hurts the environment? What if it makes people more screen addicted? But I helped her answer those questions, and yeah, now she installed Blue Wallet, and she ha is happily using Bitcoin. Whoa. Awesome. The other two friends that I'd mainly want to talk about orange pilling would be my friends Ama and Ikshul. I orange pilled them today, actually. Um, I orange pilled Ama <laughs> while yeah. waiting over there. So, um, got a new one now. And I mainly do it whenever someone asks me about Bitcoin or asks me, well, you know, what's your perspective? Or how did you get to know it? Or why are you interested in it? And then we, I basically make the conversation go deeper and then start orange pilling them. Okay, great. So, um, uh, my question then for, for Ricardo would be, uh, we talked about time horizons when, uh, when Bitcoin may be adopted completely. What, what do you think about this? Especially when it comes to well-developed no nations like uh, Italy or USA or Germany or Europe. So, let, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I disagree with my friend here. I don't think it's going to be in 10 years. We're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, do you know one thing? What I love uh, about Bitcoin is that it goes way beyond us, right? This is going to outlast every single one of okay. us. It's not even for our kids. Bitcoin is going to last centuries, probably millennia. Um, it's such a crucial infrastructure. And keep in mind, you can clearly see this in uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, writings. The economic application is just the first one. Uh, the Bitcoin token is crucial to the security of the network, right? The Bitcoin price is crucial to the security of the network. That's why Satoshi implemented that first. But there's so much more we can build on top of it. We are go we're going to eventually make total disintermediation 
of everything on the top of Bitcoin. So when people tell me about hyper Bitcoinization, I ask myself, what do they mean? Um, Bitcoin is a global technology to transact money instantly, borderless. That's not hyper Bitcoinization to me. Uh, Bitcoin is gonna is gonna is gonna allow us to vote on a distributed network, certify on a distributed network, um, run everything that we need to be secure online and even on new technology like hyperverses, metaverses. Now it's not here, Meta metaverse is a shitcoin concept, but it's gonna happen in 50 years. So Bitcoin is gonna be crucial for all of that. It's gonna change everything in centuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, centuries, okay. Alan, what's your take on it? Um, you you, when you said, said, it, said oh, a decade, decade. You know, I think, uh, Deal with the economics, when I talk to young people, I ask them, do you realize, for example, our nation, the United States, is over $31 trillion in debt, and I'm worried for my kids and my grandkids, so I buy Bitcoin for them. I hope never to spend it. I hope they never spend it, but so my, li my premise is a long time, or low time. You know, I had a Re Re Reuters, uh, Reuters uh, newscast interview me an hour ago. He kept asking me, what about the price? Does the price bother you? No, the price does not bother me at all. In fact, Bitcoiners, the price is immaterial to the price. We believe in the technology. We see the future. The future is Bitcoin. And so uh, that's my thoughts. Okay, yeah. Um, we, there's also one typical distractor for people uh, by to using Bitcoin, at least. The, because um, if you buy Bitcoin and keep it, it's usually tax-free or not taxable events. When you spend bitcoins, and at least in some countries, it can be a taxable event. Let's talk a little bit about that. So I think, what's the situation in I Italy? I would love to say something about it, because um, uh, please, guys, spend your bitcoins. If you want these things to succeed, please spend your bitcoin. One of the reasons why Bitcoin is not widely accepted in this country. When you ask a merchant here in El Salvador, the land of the legal tender, why you don't accept Bitcoin is free, they answer you, there are too little transactions, no volume, and it's complex. Complex. Bitcoin is simple. Chivo is complex. Chivo sucks. And, 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 and it's making Bitcoin way, more, 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 way much more complex than what it should be. But why they say there is not enough transaction? Of course, they have dollars here. They don't have a hyperinflating currency. So they don't need Bitcoin for that. But there, there are so many Bitcoiners coming to this country because they say they want to support Bitcoin in this country and they flash their credit cards and they spend their shitty dollars. So please do yourself a favor. Paco is right. We need this country. We need Bitcoin in this country to succeed. If you want it to succeed, come here and spend your Satoshi, 30 bucks, 40 bucks. We are all stacking sats. We are not asking you, we are not asking you to spend them all. Just 50 bucks. If you come to this country to support Bitcoin here and you don't want to spend your Bitcoin here, please stay home. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to this and I'm going to, uh, there are these two boys here and it's, it says, let the sats flow. It says in your Bitcoin white paper, it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash transaction. It's peer-to-peer -peer and let your sats flow. If you don't want to spend 30, 40 dollars, there is Geyser. Geyser has amazing projects. If you like any project, you can give them one sat, two sats, five sats, 100 sats. Because you have to keep sharing, you know, you have to keep sharing. That's how you create a circular economy. And when it's a circular economy, Everyone's happy. Example is very simple. If he is sad, I am sad. I am sad. He is sad. We all are sad. But if he's spending sats, 
He is spending sats. He is spending sats. Everybody is spending sats. It's good to stack. It's good to have time preference. I come from a country that is gold. We have a lot of gold. We'll bail out the world. But spend your sats. For the things you love, for a beer example, I drink a lot of beer. So we can spend sats. <laughs> but yeah, that's sats. That's, that's. So let the sats flow, yeah? Uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, I have a follow-up. I have a follow-up question, Paco. Um, we all agree El Salvador is the greatest country for spending sets. What's your second best country? Si, uh, siempre. I, 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 I would say in Singapore you can do anything, but this is one country for me which was very nice was Kenya. In Kenya there is a Bitcoin bus. In Kenya you can get a massage for Bitcoin. In Kenya, you can get a mobile phone for Bitcoin, haircut for Bitcoin, clothes for Bitcoin. In Kenya, there are restaurants for Bitcoin. So Kenya for me was really like this, like I felt it. I don't know the, I don't know South Africa is there, I haven't been there, but Kenya would be the second country. Yeah. Okay. My second favorite country is by far the United States because it's so full of shit coiners there. So <laughs> if, you, if you travel to the US and you actually show them uh, that Bitcoin works, and then you tell them now, flash your Solana wallet and, and spend your Solana, they take it out and Solana is down, that's priceless, that's priceless. <laughs> um, you know, there's two, th there's two things that are certain for us in the United States, death, and taxes. Taxes. So they consider Bitcoin a commodity that when you sell your Bitcoin, the Internal Revenue Service wants to tax your profit. So what do we do? How can we spend Bitcoin without worrying about, am I paying taxes? Do I owe taxes? It's too complicated with all my Bitcoin transactions to worry about taxes. So I am thrilled to have an ally in strike. Because in Strike, I attach to my debit card, I spend cash, the vendor receives Bitcoin. Wow, problem solved. Here in El Salvador, guess what? A year ago, I spent SATS Bitcoin via the Strike app here in El Salvador. So for the tax problem, we have this, uh, this solution. Also, we now have legislators in America trying to re have some regulation which should help Bitcoin and regulate the other cryptocurrencies that are causing so many headaches. There's legislation currently through Senator Lummis from Wyoming that you can spend up to $200 in your Bitcoin without realizing a taxable gain. We'll see what happens, but at the end of the day, my go-to uh, technique is to use Strike to give Bitcoin or to buy in Bitcoin. And then we have BitRefill. I'll, I'll go to a vendor store, I'll buy through Strike, I'll buy a gift certificate, spending Bitcoin. I tell the cashier, hey, guess what? Today I am buying my dog food with Bitcoin. Really? It's incredible. So I take a picture. <laughs> when I orange pill someone, I take a picture. And guess what? They're always smiling in the picture. So Bitcoin makes people smile. Awesome. <laughs> So I've actually got kind of a funny story when it comes to taxes. Um, in Germany, as Ulf probably knows, um, assets held for over one year are um, not subject to capital gains tax. So if you, you know, hold an asset for over a year and then uh, you know, sell it or spend it, including Bitcoin, um, you don't have capital gains tax. However, the reporting requirements on cryptocurrency, which includes Bitcoin officially, um, are kind of a pain, as in you have to report every single transaction and you end up with these giant lists. Last year I tried something new. I did my tax reporting with it listed as foreign currency instead, Salvadoran Bitcoin. They accepted it. The reporting requirements are different. So it's still tax, for, it's still tax free for over one year and capital gains tax for less than one year, so the, the amount of tax paid doesn't change. But the reporting requirements for foreign currency only says you have to say how much in, how much out. So you don't have to list every transaction. So thank you, El Salvador. You made my taxes way easier. <laughs> Samantha, anything you want to share? 
Uh, yes, I'd quickly like to say I definitely agree with Ricardo. I think that in the future, at least hopefully, Bitcoin will be more worldwide and you should definitely help the circular economy. And otherwise, all I'd say is that my family has been, our bank account has been empty since 2017 and we've been living on only Bitcoin. And it has worked, which proves that Bitcoin does definitely work. It's not something that would just fail. So when people realize this, they should really inquire into it and then hopefully use it. Good. Awesome. Awesome. So we have three minutes left uh, and I will wrap this up with the closing rounds. Any thoughts you have, anything you would like to share, any story you'd like to tell? So Paco, please. Um, I would really like to thank the Bitcoiners. Muchisima gracias. Every time they say Bitcoiners are toxic, they are maxis. I say Bitcoiner is a Bitcoiner and a no-coiner is a no-coiner. <laughs> because I, m many Bitcoiners invited me to their house, they gave me food, they took me out, they orange pilled and they shared love. So Bitcoiners are good people. Bitcoiners are just like your parents. Because if your parents weren't strict with you, you wouldn't be here. So thanks to these Bitcoiners, I really thank them. And thank you everybody who supported this journey and one thing is really really close to my heart is if Bitcoin fails, humanity fails. Yeah. Good point. The truth is that Bitcoin cannot fail because Bitcoin is, <laughs> is more than a technology if you think about it. It's an idea, it's a concept. If it fails, we fork it and we remake it better. So once, once that the rabbit is outside the cylinder, you cannot take it back. Yeah. Bitcoin is, is a software. So if it fails, good, we fix it and we start it all over again. So Bitcoin is inevitable. So guys, buckle up and enjoy the ride. We are making history, folks. This is historical. Awesome, awesome. You know, I came here to El Salvador for the first time last year to this Adopting Bitcoin conference. It lit my fuse to go home and be an evangelist for Bitcoin, spread the good news. And so I want to encourage all the attendees here this time not to soak in all the great information, but to allow it to light your fuse, to go home to your respective corners of the world, and to change the world where you are. I talked to two young gentlemen, maybe 18, 20 last night here. I interviewed them. They're both in Bitcoin a year, and they had nothing but glowing things to say about Bitcoin. I said, wow, this is the future of the world. I love sharing with people how Bitcoin is improving people's lives all over the world. It's improving me and my family's life. So I just want to encourage people to don't be shy. Put aside your inhibitions. Be brave, put it out there, and you will not regret because you will change somebody's life in a positive way through Bitcoin. I'd just like to leave everyone with the thought that I mentioned during my introduction about myself, um, the opportunity cost of spending Bitcoin is the same as that of spending fiat that you could have exchanged for Bitcoin but didn't. If you hold fiat right now, Think about the fact that you could exchange that for Bitcoin. You know, spend $10 worth of Bitcoin. You know, what's the difference between doing that and spending $10 worth of fiat that you could exchange for Bitcoin? Why are you still holding that fiat? Stop it. Get rid of it. All of you. Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. Samantha, your last, famous last words. In the last 20 seconds, I'd just like to say all of you are lucky to be part of the first Bitcoiners. I'd like to say that all of you can help more people be Bitcoiners and that all of you are lucky to just be a start of our journey. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was an awesome panel. Right. And, and we, make a, we make a selfie now. So let's go. <laughs> okay, here we go, here we go. Come on, Samantha. Now, I ask, where is Joe Nakamoto? Come on, do your work. 
<laughs> you Sorry, Ricky. lazy Brit. Sorry, I, mean, I feel like orange pilling anything right now. What an amazing panel, guys. What an amazing panel. Congratulations, everyone. Well done. Well done. Thank well done. you. Well done. That was phenomenal. Uh, I literally feel like orange pilling the wall behind me. Um, and also, I need to work harder than ever because Samantha is going to put us all out of a media job. <laughs> she is fantastic.